the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. I can't tell you how happy I am to physically be here. <laughs> this table has been, had been my home for 12, 13 years and it hasn't been for 15 months. So it's wonderful to, to be back on campus and uh, seeing students and colleagues uh, in person. Um, this uh, is the first of a series of events that our Ukraine Studies program uh, will be presenting this semester. Uh, and this is the first one that we've done in this hybrid fashion. We've been online uh, programming online for the past year and a half. Um, so what that means is that in addition to everyone who came uh, and was able to come today, uh, uh, we have our viewers on Zoom and on YouTube who've been our lawyer followers for the last year and a half. So we're happy to, to give this a go in this hybrid uh, format. Um, just want to let you know what is coming up uh, and we will be going back and forth as things go because, uh, as far as in-person or hybrid, but um, on September 29th at 7 p.m. Um, the Ukraine Film Club, Columbia University will be screening the film, well, not screening the film, having discussion of the film, The War Syndrome, I'm Used to Killing. Uh, so that will be online. Uh, so please uh, go to the Harriman website and our page if you want more information about how to take part in that. Um, and that's with uh, Director Olena Solodovnikova, who will be present, yes, uh, in the virtual event. And then on October 14th, we have an event entitled Encounter the Ukrainian Jewish Literary Prize and Other Recent Developments in Ukrainian Literature, uh, where we will have uh, two writers, uh, Vasil Makhno and Andrei Kurkov discussing uh, Vasil Makhno's novel, The Eternal Calendar, which received the first Encounter Ukraine Jewish Literary Prize. And we'll be talking about other things in contemporary Ukrainian literature. That event is going to be completely online. Um, and then we have another event that I didn't print it out. Uh, Yes, so that's what we'll have that for now. As far as today's event, uh, we will be discussing this wonderful new publication. Uh, after our presentation, you'll be have an opportunity to ask questions. I'll be monitoring, so uh, moderating. So please give me the question. I'll be monitoring here for questions online as well, and we'll kind of shuffle between those. Um, and I'll just finally add that this is being recorded, and then this will be on YouTube forever and ever. Uh, and that that microphone is very sensitive. <laughs> Those two are connected. Uh, so today we're presenting uh, this brand new uh, hot off the press publication, Ukrainian English Publication Dictionary by Yuri Shevchuk. Yuri Shevchuk uh, is a lecturer of Ukrainian at Columbia University. Uh, he's been lecturing, uh, teaching Ukrainian here since 2004. Uh, he's a leading specialist in Ukrainian English lexicography. From 1990 to 2012, he also taught Ukrainian at Harvard University's uh, summer school. Uh, he's also a translator whose published translations include George Orwell's Animal Farm, two, two uh, editions came out of that, and Otto Sopeny's uh, best-selling Ukraine a History, which was a leading text in the early 90s in Ukraine. Uh, in education. Uh, he's author, also authored this uh, wonderful book, Beginners Ukrainian and with Interactive Online Workbook, which was the first uh, Ukrainian instruction book to come out in, in English in, in eons and is widely used. Um, and it was published by Hippocrene Books, who also published uh, today's book. Uh, he writes and speaks on issues of language, identity, culture, and Ukrainian cinema. Uh, Yuri also leads our Ukrainian film club. Uh, film uh, club and teaches a course in, in cinema. And his forthcoming publication is the first ever conceptual study of the use of language in Ukrainian Soviet and post Soviet cinema. So please join me in welcoming uh, Yuri. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Marco, for this uh, uh, kind introduction and uh, kind words. And uh, welcome uh, to you all. Uh, thank you for coming in these uh, trying and uh, confusing times. Uh, before I uh, start my presentation, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, the Herman Institute for the multiple grants, uh, thanks to which uh, this publication and this too, uh, became possible, were possible, uh, as well to the, as to the Heritage Foundation of the First Securities Savings Bank of Chicago, who, uh, invariably supported me generously 
uh, in uh, uh, preparing uh, for publications uh, this uh, dictionary and also this book. Uh, can you switch on that? So, uh, way back when I started teaching Ukrainian in 1990 at Harvard Summer School, uh, and up until very recently, my students always complained about there being no dictionary that is usable for them to learn uh, to learn Ukrainian. Uh, okay. Does it work? <laughs> I can't change the slides for some reason. Oh, no, I can't. So uh, a little bit, uh, everything is understood in, in its context, and it's very important, the context, the historical context of uh, uh, the state of things in Ukrainian uh, language, foreign language pedagogy is important. Under the Soviet occupation of Ukraine, uh, the, uh, the very uh, major of Ukrainian language as a foreign language simply did not exist. The implication was that Ukrainian was quietly dying, and uh, there would be nobody, no demand for uh, foreigners uh, to want to learn Ukrainian. The game was a Russian language and uh, teaching Russian as a foreign language was not only very well developed with all the resources and everything, but also very prestigious because it uh, meant that specialists trained in that field would get to work with foreigners and would uh, get to kind of penetrate the, the iron curtain and uh, often be sent to to countries like uh, like cuba like poland like uh, african and asian and latin american countries uh, where russian was taught so when i started teaching ukrainian the field was really uh, that of a desert uh, in ukraine uh, there was one book published for propaganda reasons just to show that we have a, a textbook uh, ukrainian for foreigners it was absolutely unusable uh, and uh, other than that, there were no even students in Ukrainian universities who learned Ukrainian as a foreign language. The exception was uh, 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 academic institutions and scholars of the Ukrainian diaspora in North America, in the United States and uh, Canada. And so books, uh, Ukrainian textbooks were published here. Uh, uh, they uh, kind of uh, were published in a bit of an isolation from the Ukrainian cultural mainland and uh, had that kind of a, uh, an influence. Sometimes Ukrainian would be, uh, would show some archaic features that were not found any longer in Ukrainian language on the mainland. And, uh, but as far as the dictionaries were, I, you, you can see uh, two, uh, textbooks, Modern Ukrainian by Asia Humetska that I uh, knew by heart because that's the book I used with my students at Harvard for uh, almost 2019 summers as I taught at Harvard summer school. It was, uh, it was basic. It was uh, not a lot of fun to use it. There were no pictures at all. Uh, it was uh, just, but, but it was the best that there was. Another book, Rozmovlaimo, uh, Let's Talk, was written by a group of, of, of authors. Uh, uh, and uh, was, uh, I was very excited when it, uh, when it came out. And then I quickly found out that I couldn't use it. Uh, there were too, mu too much uh, in too little space crammed and the students were simply confused. And, uh, and so all of that, but dictionaries were even worse. The, the, the only dictionary that was published with uh, thoughts of uh, foreigners or, uh, or second language learners uh, in mind was uh, a Ukrainian English dictionary by Andrew Sishin. It was published in mid 1950s. And uh, it was the only game in town. The, the dictionary was never updated, was never modernized. And uh, uh, 75 years passed and uh, uh, so it was still uh, uh, ruling supreme. And when I wrote with a proposal to University of Toronto Press uh, to publish, uh, so that they published my dictionary, they kindly turned uh, the proposal down saying that uh, 
our dictionary, our position dictionary is selling very well. So we don't have the need to, to do anything else. Thank you. Uh, so that says something about the, not only uh, how backward the, the whole lexicography, Ukrainian English uh, lexicography uh, uh, has been before this dictionary got published, but also the general attitude and the kind of requirements, the level of expectation of it that uh, somehow was predominant here. So uh, the Ukrainian English Collocation Dictionary, uh, this one, and uh, those of you who would like to, to look through it are perfectly welcome, I, I brought it here, it's, it's heavy, <laughs> uh, is the first ever Ukrainian dictionary that describes the core Ukrainian lexicon combined with other words and how it combines with other words into phrases and sentences. So collocation is the key word in understanding what this dictionary is about. Uh, uh, by some uh, uh, serious calculations uh, between the period of 1596 up until today, uh, some uh, 9,240 Ukrainian dictionaries were published both in Ukraine and outside. Yet no Ukrainian collocation dictionary was ever published. There were collocation dictionaries in English, in other languages, in Russian, but I found no bilingual collocation dictionary. Uh, I, I, can, I, I can say why, because uh, 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 preparing, compiling a bilingual collocation dictionary means reducing two languages to comparable structures and it's a very a great challenge to do that particularly when we talk about two languages that are differently organized ukrainian is a synthetic language it's all about endings the english uh, language is analytical the endings are almost uh, absent with some you know remnants it's all about uh, prepositions and stuff and to to kind of bring them together to comparable structures and then describe them it was really a challenge. Uh, so collocation dictionary is about how to teach you not to uh, not so much to know what a particular word means. That's the start of every dictionary, I would say, but uh, to teach you as the user how to combine a, a given word uh, which lexicographers call an entry word uh, uh, with uh, other words in typical minimal uh, two member uh, collocations. And uh, I would give you just uh, uh, an example. I have I mustn't forget that I have to. A collocation dictionary describes how a word combines with other words in two word expressions and then become building blocks uh, for sentences. So uh, let's take the noun the clouds. I will give examples in English in case uh, there are people who don't understand Ukrainian, but it can, it's uh, the same in Ukrainian. So it, uh, the, the noun can be combined as any noun with adjectives, with other nouns, with prepositions, with verbs, and uh, some other. So a collocation dictionary describes such typical combinations of cloud, uh, collocations with adjectives, big, enormous, heavy, and so on, so forth. So these are adjectives, right? Then there are more uh, terminological collocations, and you can see them in the dictionary, and uh, I'm just uh, giving an example. <coughs> Oops. So there are collocations with other uh, nouns that are in preposition. For instance, a hail cloud, right? A rain cloud, a snow cloud, a storm cloud. Collocations with other nouns that are in post position, or sometimes the uh, uh, lexicographers say on the left or on the right. Uh, so a bank of clouds, a layer of clouds, a formation of clouds. Collocations with verbs, when uh, uh, the cloud is an object of a predicate. For example, to drive a cloud, strong wind drove the snow clouds westwards to disperse a cloud, to appear behind, from behind a cloud, to disappear in a cloud, and so on and so forth. Collocations with verbs where the cloud is subject and the verb is predicate. 
uh, clouds gather, clouds appear, clouds amass, uh, clouds drift, float, move, block something, cover something, obscure something. You get, you, you get the, the logic. Collocations with prepositions that describe all kinds of local relationships, for instance, in a cloud, into a cloud, uh, on a cloud, between two clouds, and on and on and on. Then a collocation dictionary teaches learners to view the infinity of words in a language, not as something chaotic, intimidating, and unpredictable, but suddenly as a system, never mind how large you might think that that uh, vocabulary of a foreign language is, but this system becomes logically organized and predictable. Uh, the described syntactic relationship of the noun cloud that I just quoted with other parts of speech help us come up with a logical approach that can be used to describe every noun, every verb, adjective, etc. in a lexicon. Within this logic, we can always ask ourselves, what clouds can there be? Or if it's not a cloud, if it's a book, what book can there, what books can there be? What cars can there be? What schools can there be? What universities can there be? What politics can there be? You see, suddenly there appears a logic that this kind of organize, organizing a dictionary uh, introduces. We can ask ourselves, what form can a cloud take? Uh, what can one do with a cloud? What can one do with a book? What can one do with a computer? What can I do with a counterpart and so on? That all is uh, like uh, you will find the information in this kind of dictionary, in a collocation dictionary. With the uh, with, uh, uh, proviso that in my dictionary, it's the information is found not only in one language, but in two languages, which is uh, uh, unprecedented. I would be grateful if somebody points me to a bilingual in a collocation dictionary. I wasn't able to find one. Uh, so I'm going to uh, skip things that are uh, 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 that I don't think are immediately uh, pertinent, but if you would like to talk about the challenges of compiling such a dictionary. The first one, of course, identifying which words should be in the dictionary and which one shouldn't. So I had some people tell me, oh, I was looking in your, in your dictionary for this word and it's, it's not there. Well, you were using the wrong dictionary. This dictionary is not a translation dictionary per se. That's what the translation dictionary is about, to give you the uh, meaning of uh, almost every word you might want to, to uh, whose meaning you might want to know. This dictionary, you have to think of this dictionary in terms of the most frequently used words. And, uh, uh, and then thinking if the word to, for to uh, speak and then to talk and then to mumble and then to whisper and on and on and on and on, maybe uh, it's enough to know the collocability of one synonym because the collocability of other synonyms is going to be very similar with, again, a reservation that some synonyms are, for instance, whisper is, uh, you can't whisper, or you, can, you can actually can whisper loudly, you can speak loudly, you can whisper loudly, but that's the way you, you want to think about a collocation dictionary, not, uh, and because collocation dictionaries are not as popular and not as frequently used as simply translation dictionaries, people have expectations from the wrongly placed expectations from them that, that as if they were translation dictionaries and the other way around they do not expect collocation dictionaries to help them with things that they didn't know there was help about like how to combine words and stuff like that so uh when i uh, when you combine uh, when you compile a dictionary there are two principles uh, like, uh, in lexicography. One is descriptive. You, you simply describe what is in the language. And the, another one is prescriptive. You prescribe the good, the normative, the standard language, and you try to push out and ignore things that you don't think is good usage. Uh, the Ukrainian situation is very special in that 
Ukrainian has been an object of Russification, relentless Russification over centuries. And everybody who compiles a Ukrainian dictionary of whatever kind is inevitably faced with the dilemma. Do I describe the language as it is today and include everything that I hear today, what is spoken, including by uh, used in government documents at the highest level, and that way uh, legitimize dozens and hundreds Russian words that were imposed in year of Ukrainian words. Do I register in my dictionary the word Kazna and Kaznachesky, that is all, uh, patently Russian borrowing, because there is Skarbnitsa and Skarbnitsa in Ukrainian, or do I apply the elements of this of prescriptive approach and say no i want to a kind of uh, regulate the that uh, onslaught of a foreign influence on the language and thus protect the language and give the language through the kind of legitimizing uh, power of a dictionary and uh, any dictionary by by its very fact of existence has this kind of legitimizing logic. If it's in the dictionary, it should be so. Uh, so I uh, try to combine, to find a kind of middle uh, way between these two. On the one hand, uh, ignore things, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, Russian borrowings that are completely unjustified because they don't introduce even new concepts. They simply replace indigenous Ukrainian word, and on the other hand, encourage what I thought, uh, and uh, not so much I thought, but what in the Ukrainian national uh, pre-Soviet and anti-colonial lexicographical and linguistic tradition is considered to be good usage. And so, for instance, the word Ozdoba and Prekrasa, these are two uh, synonyms. Ozdoba is now very uh, rarely used, even though it's very frequently used in Ukrainian classical literature. Prekrasa is easily recognizable as ukrasenie. So, so uh, uh, the, the dictionary favors indigenous Ukrainian words in such pairs. Parubok, the meaning of uh, parubok as a bachelor has been forgotten. And if you watch the film by uh, Zygavertov, A Man with a Movie Camera, the camera for a second focuses on a document, on a statistical document, on a census document in Ukraine, and the word parubok, simeine stan, the family status, and it registers the word parubok. Now nobody uses that in that sense. It's used, it's used as simply as a, as a young man, but not in this uh, uh, terminological sense, and so on and so forth. So uh, also the dictionary resists uh, these uh, needless the the, the 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 kind of um, uh, resisting tendency of junk, junk borrowings from English that are informed by by the desire of people to come across as uh, wizards as fashionable as cool because they speak English so they would use content instead of Ukrainian zmist they would use account instead of Ukrainian rachunok accounts on on the internet uh, and, and so on and so forth. And these are just, uh, I, I call them uh, uh, the junk borrowings uh, that are manifestation of such, a, such an attitude. So what's in the dictionary, in this dictionary? Uh, about 8,500 uh, words that make up the most frequently used segment of modern Ukrainian lexicon. And uh, the dictionary covers colloquial vocabulary, as well as that of politics, culture, uh, education, information, technology, economics, finance and business, youth culture, sports, cooking, filmmaking, religion, medicine, uh, and vulgarisms. Ooh or full letter words or swear words because uh, in ukrainian lexicography vulgarism is used uh, to refer to words that are not really vulgar in in english uh, sense of the word uh, they they can be printed uh, 
of algorithms in uh, English lexicology are those that are considered like obscene, obscenities. And so the dictionary uh, describes them in English, the most frequently ones, the frequent ones. So uh, this dictionary actually combines uh, the principal features of six types of dictionaries in one. Uh, number one, those who are leafing through it or are familiar with it know that it's a translation dictionary. Uh, then it's also a learner's dictionary, collocation dictionary, that's what it's called, thesaurus, a dictionary of synonyms. It's a phraseological dictionary, and finally, it's an, an, an encyclopedia. So as a translation dictionary, it offers English equivalents of each meaning of the entry described. So if we take, for example, the noun druzina, it'll be, it, it'll describe its, uh, it doesn't purport to describe all of the meanings registered of a given entry, but the most frequently used ones. So druzina, the first meaning is wife, the second meaning is a team, squad, or group. The meaning that has been uh, progressively ousted in favor of this Russian thing called komanda. So people rarely use now uh, like sport, sportivna družina, futbolna družina, even though it's beautiful usage. It's a very nice Ukrainian usage. I once spoke with uh, with uh, Polish film director Krzysztof Zanusi, and he was marveling at this beautiful Ukrainian noun Druzina that is from Drug. You call your, your wife Druzina because it, it means that your wife is also your friend, your Drug, and, and so on. So, so a foreigner was kind of marveling at how at many levels of semantics and associations that this particular word entails. Then finally, Druzina is an army, troops or host, like Knyaza Druzina, the princely host, and so on. Now, uh, the dictionary describes new meanings and words that are not described uh, yet in Ukrainian dictionaries, including even in academic ones. For example, the new meaning of the word Maidan, all of us who follow Ukraine know that Maidan initially is simply a square. And that, uh, in that meaning, the word was ousted or progressively pushed out to the periphery of the language in favor of Ploshcha, which is cognate with Russian Ploshcha, even though every Ukrainian school, uh, school child knows Na Maidani Kolotserkvi Revolutsia, Hude, a classical uh, poem by uh, Tychina, by uh, Pavlo Tychina. But Maidan, because uh, thanks to these uh, four, three mobilizations, political mobilizations uh, in the center of, of Kyiv, in the Maidan of independence, acquired this new meaning of a protest, campaign, revolution, uprising, mobilization. You can see it, uh, where is my, you can see it here, registered in this dictionary, in my dictionary. And then, and then as a watchdog, Maidan Zakordonnik Sprav, for a fair watchdog closely monitors and so on. This meaning is, uh, I would, I, uh, I would uh, maintain that this is the first dictionary that register uh, these uh, new meanings. Then there is the, the word mema. Everybody says mem, just like in Russian, even though the formant mema, meme, is, is present in many words that are already known in Ukraine, like phonema, grafema, idolohema. Not net, ne phonem, ne grafem, in a idolohem. In that sense, the dictionary introduces this prescriptive usage that it should be feminine noun, Vona, mema, and then what kind of memas can there be? What, what memes can there be? Uh, and uh, it, if you look it up in the dictionary, you will see. And then there are other things that, are, uh, 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 that have new meanings. For, for instance, the word columnist. You, in Ukrainian, Ukrainian journalists say kolumnist, which is a strange word. After all, the word column exists in Ukrainian. It's kolona. Kolonka. So the dictionary, based on that derivational kind of trajectory, uh, introduces the word kolonkar, the one who writes the kolonka. Vin kolonkar hazete takoi itakoi. The dictionary treats head on uh, the phenomenon that is a problem for any 
bilingual translation dictionary, the so-called non-equivalent items. Every language, due to it being original, inimitable way of verbalizing reality, has words that are absent as one word equivalents in other language. They are called in lexicography or in the theory of translation, non-equivalent items. And Ukrainian language has them too. They pertain to cultural phenomena that are specific to Ukrainian culture. Uh, they pertain to a very specific, and, and you can see uh, a great number of them. Uh, they are present in the dictionary. They are uh, highlighted by special uh, um, label, lexicographical label, so that you can easily find them. And they, and the dictionary proposes how to not only describe them, but what to do with them. Sometimes it's just trans, transliteration, like Pisanka, uh, is a painted Easter egg, uh, and the dictionary in English says Pisanka, the way to use it, because it, it carries an entire kind of, it's culturally colored, specifically in a Ukrainian way. For, a, for Ukrainians, Pisanka has a very specific uh, range of cultural associations and, and many others. Then there is a group of uh, 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 words that are connected with a specific grammatical way of painting the reality. For instance, Ukrainian has a, a, a peculiar group of color of verbs that verbs that denote the dynamic color characteristic. That means the color that changes. For instance, bilite not to become white, but to uh, show up white, like uh, snow-covered peaks showed up white on the horizon. And in Ukrainian, it's, it's one word. Uh, a lot of dictionaries don't have that equivalent. They don't know how to, how to translate bilite, cervonite, zelenite, Sirite and so on, not to become, but to show up as a particular color. Sepole cervonilo makame. All uh, the entire field uh, was red with poppies or something, or showed up red uh, uh, with poppies or some, something like that. That's a problem. The dictionary is trying to kind of address this problem. And finally, verbs of motion is a specifically Sla Slavic way of presenting motion, either as linear or as circular, either as a one-time thing or as something repeated, something that the uh, English grammar is completely blind to. And the dictionary describes these pairs of, of verbs, as clearly de demarcated, not only labeling them unidirectional and multidirectional, but also assigning to them different sets of adverbs that characterize them in that way, making it much easier for learner to understand the logic of where you use unidirectional verb and where you use multidirectional verb. It's a learner's dictionary. It's, per it's absolutely packed with loads of information about Ukrainian drama, about Ukrainian morphology, endings and syntax. No dictionary has that to such an extent that I know. Uh, so it gives grammatical gender of nouns, uh, declension type of nouns so that you know what endings the noun takes, case endings if the noun uh, and ending is uh, irregular in some way or if there are mutations or all kinds of shifts in the end of the of the step of the noun stem, biblioteca, biblioteci, olha, uh, when there are shifts of consonants, they are all here. There's nothing to look up anywhere else. You can all get, get it here. Mutations that suffer, conjugation types of verbs, uh, tense endings, and cases they require when combined with nouns and much more. So Ukrainians themselves very often don't know whether to say uh, uh, all these things are taken care of. You can check by that dictionary all these difficult grammar cases. It's a collocation dictionary. You already know what it is. 
but it gives the most typical combinations. The entry word is pato. Sorry. Uh, a total of more than uh, 200,000 of such minimal uh, two member collocations are given in this dictionary. Uh, to give the user a better idea of how the entry word is used in full blown sentence, carefully constructed illustrative quotations are offered, about 80,000 of them. And unlike uh, a dictionary, a kind of academic dictionary where uh, qu quotations, uh, uh, illustrative quotations are taken from actual literature, to make things easy and immediately helpful, these uh, uh, illustrations uh, or, or these quotations, these examples are constructed so that there's nothing uh, redundant in them, nothing that will attract you or detract your attention from the phenomenon that is being uh, exemplified. Uh, it's a thesaur, it's a thesaurus. Uh, it lists uh, about 8,000 synonyms, 5,000 synonymic groups and about a thousand antonyms by deploying a, a system of labels that send you to, to a, one entry to its synonyms, to its uh, close synonyms. By the way, there is a special uh, uh, label that warns you that these synonyms are close, but there are important differences between them that you need to, to consult the other one so that you don't make a, a mistake that a lot of people do. Uh, so, and it draws uh, these semantic differentiation between close synonyms, imya and uh, nazva. They are all translated as a name, but in English, a name could be an, a person's name, but also a name of the, uh, of the film. In Ukrainian, it's specialized. Uh, one is only for people, uh, uh, others is for other things. The same thing. Istina and Pravda, truth, when to use Istina, when to use Pravda, uh, when to use Klaste or Stavite. In English, it's put. English is, uh, you, you don't uh, often say he stood his, uh, his, uh, his telephone on the table and then it fell. But Ukrainians customarily uh, differentiate whether it's, uh, so you cannot, you cannot uh, you cannot stand the newspaper unless you really stand it, you have to put it. That's the mistake that American Ukrainians often do because they come from this English influence that where there is no difference. Robota and Pratya, work and job. Uh, elitarni, elitni, usmishka i posmishka. And many others that Ukrainians themselves very often don't even know there are differences. All they are listed in this dictionary and described. Okay. Phraseological dictionary. Uh, it uh, gives you loads, hundreds of popular Ukrainian phraseologisms and their English and their, their English equivalents. And it's fun to read it. It's one of the reasons why this dictionary is simply fun to to leave through and read it because because it also introduces you into the culture, the specific way uh, Ukrainian sense of, sense of humor, Ukrainian ways uh, of pe perceiving the world and describing it. So you see uh, some of those uh, uh, phraseological. Uh, and finally, it's, a, it's an encyclopedia. It gives general cultural information. Uh, if you open automobile, a car, you will find out what kind of cars there can, can be or, or pronunciation or uh, a building or liberalism or opposition or or transformation that's general this, uh, information and there is ukraine specific information about ukrainian popular person names anthroponyms ukrainian toponyms uh, the names of ukrainian uh, towns and cities ukrainian hydronyms lakes and rivers and stuff like that uh, Ukrainian etiquette, geography, history, politics, culture, and on and on and on. And all this information is in the dictionary. And the dictionary is uh, a couple of things that it does for the first time. Uh, uh, number one, it gives a very detailed description of Ukrainian prepositions. Prepositions are very highly frequently used. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, layer of vocabulary in many languages in Ukrainian as well. So you can take a look. The, uh, the blue is the number of meanings 
of a, of a given proposition given in my dictionary and the number of meanings given in the fullest academic 11 length 11 volume dictionary of the ukrainian academy of sciences so mostly my dictionary is more uh, is more detailed in its description of prepositions and also illustrating exactly how they are used then the dictionary gives something that no other dictionary that i have come across gives that means differentiating between two two very very different situations uh, that are important to Ukrainian vision of the world. The static situation, the static position of an object, and the motion of that object. For instance, uh, for Ukrainian, it matters whether you put the phone on the table, plus the telephone, na steel, that's na plus accusative case, or that the phone is on the table, stasis, telephone na stoli, Two different structures, two different uh, cases are used. Whether the cat uh, went and uh, lay down under the table, it leaked peat steel, that's accusative with the same uh, preposition peat, and uh, the cat is lying under the table, it peat stolom, two different things. For English, it's completely the same situation. That dictionary allows the, uh, the learner to quickly understand the differences between these situations and it goes across the board special labels are assigned to such situation why is posn uh, position and another one is dir direction of motion and finally vulgarisms vulgarisms ukrainians it's it's funny how i every time i lecture in uh, pu uh, give public lectures in ukraine there will always be a question about should ukrainians swear uh, what is your opinion as a linguist? Of course, Ukrainians should swear. The problem is not uh, in swearing and not swearing. The problem is swearing where it's appropriate. The, there are situations for every functionally and stylistically marked layer of vocabulary that, that is proper. If you cross that situation, if you go outside of that, then that's a problem. And so I tell, and Ukrainians have their own swear words. And Ukrainian lexicography have up, up until the publication of this dictionary has been kind of uh, a very, very uh, uh, proper and uh, I would say hypocritic. They, they pretended that these words didn't exist. And these words, meanwhile, are very frequently used. It's a high frequency vocabulary. My American students would always pester me to teach them to swear in Ukrainian. Now I don't have to say no to them, because then they will say, well, the only thing I learned in this course was swearing. Now I, I will just refer them to this dictionary. And, and uh, those uh, 10 or 12 uh, uh, very bad words are described in detail. The, the wonderful thing about that description is that uh, not only their direct meaning is described, but what happens to them when they are used metaphorically the interesting the breathtaking semantic transformations that they undergo are simply meaning a thing or or some or some such thing it's it's really very interesting how uh, how uh, uh, a word can change from its direct meaning to another so if you look up those words i'm not going to pronounce them even though uh, at one point, I was giving an interview on the dictionary uh, on Ukrainian radio, and the host enumerated them all on, on, mm -hmm. on, on the air. And I was absolutely shocked uh, uh, out of the water and said, well, we, your radio would be closed down within five minutes in the United States. <laughs> so uh, intended users, I'm wrapping up. Uh, the, the dictionary is uh, much uh, is uh, is targeting uh, uh, the uh, uh, kind of uh, a much wider user than one would think. Number one, of course, learners of Ukrainian uh, of all levels. Not only you would think, oh, this is a, such a thick dictionary and so much information, so I will have to learn Ukrainian to two years before I can use it. No, absolutely not. I gave seminars and workshops at conferences to show how this dictionary can be used the moment you start, you learn to read Ukrainian. It can immediately be used and they scale up 
uh, and uh, the, the task can be complicated. What it gives you is the wonderful feeling of <clears throat> ownership of the language, of the language that you learn. You start immediately feeling that it's not foreign to you, that you own it, that you know what to do once you understand the logic of how the dictionary is constructed. What it does, it's yours. And nobody will tell you because you can you can check things, you can learn things, you can be you can create language and grow and amplify your knowledge of language just between you and that dictionary, starting with the elementary level. Then native speakers of Ukrainian wishing to perfect their language. And uh, I'm not uh, kind of I don't hesitate saying that it's uh, I learned so many things as I was compiling this dictionary over 10 years of work uh, every single day on it. And so I, I would recommend it to any school in Ukraine. It ha it, it's a must um, uh, because it, it just teaches you it's, it's geared to single mindedly instruct you on good usage and think of, la of language logically. As simple, my students who are here, uh, they know uh, a supposedly simple thing that I would pull, I pose a question to any one of you uh, very often provokes uh, a puzzled silence. Uh, like if I ask you, can you come up with as many as possible descriptors of the table? What kind of table can there be? And then, ooh, Okay, one, two, three, four, and then five, and then that's it. That dictionary teaches you to kind of uh, stretch and massage your logical thinking, uh, not only in Ukrainian, but in your native English. And in that sense, uh, its putative potential user is really unlimited. Uh, then uh, Ukrainian learners of English, naturally, and uh, a huge uh, number of professionals, increasing number of professionals who work in Ukrainian environment and who increasingly uh, appreciate that you will never understand Ukraine. You will never feel that you understand Ukraine outside the Ukrainian language. There's still an attitude that while learning Ukrainian, you can just know Russian and, and that's all. <clears throat> Uh, and so that that kind of thing. So uh, the dictionary is easily uh, obtainable at Amazon.com, or I have a couple of copies that I will be happy to to sign for you. They are a little bit uh, more expensive; they are sixty dollars each. But if if you like, uh, I'll be happy to uh, to sign one for you. Uh, and uh, that's my presentation. I would. Be glad to thank you. Your, thank, you your thank you, Ray, and congratulations. I, I know uh, over the past 10 years, I would run into you here and you'd be working on it uh, sometimes, even during attending a lecture, <laughs> not really paying attention. I see <laughs> adding to the dictionary, adding and adding. So, uh, a colossal work, and congratulations once thank more. Thank you, and thanks for uh, describing it to us in detail. Um, I've been lucky to have had a copy of this for two weeks. So uh, we're gonna open up the floor to questions both from this person and online. I will be reading to you, but let me start with a question I had. You, know, the, you have the introduction, which you've gone through parts of it today to the book. Uh, and there seems to be this kind of overarching um, emphasis on the vibrancy and the fact that this language uh, is alive. It's not just in a book, right? Uh, you keep referring to that. But at the same time, there seems to be this kind of bemoaning of the lack of use of existing Ukrainian uh, sayings. And uh, mentioned the phraseology, how you how you show these uh, words combined in Ukraine to, to express something important or to, to emotional or beautiful or sad. Uh, so, at the one hand, it's very vibrant uh, and alive language. But the other. Uh, it's not being used by everyone. So, um, and I, I see your, your dictionary, your publication as a step in trying to address this, uh, this problem. I, I don't know if I'm correct, but uh, to answer it, that's my first question. But the other is, uh, if that is correct, uh, how much of an uphill climb is this? Is anybody else 
uh, during this? Do you know any other publications or initiatives happening in, in Ukraine in the educational sphere or, or in Ukrainian studies in Ukraine literature uh, and authors? Anybody else trying to return to this vibrant, this Ukrainian language that, that had these things but has been kind of phased out? Mm -hmm. That that's a that's a, a hugely important question, and it's not limited to language itself. Uh, my students, I, I was marking my students' assignments uh, today in the morning, and and uh, in one of the exercises, uh, one of the exercises asked them to to uh, say what, in their opinion, was a, a major drawback that Ukraine had. And uh, somebody wrote that. The major drawback is that Ukraine doesn't know how rich it is and how to use its riches. And, and that kind of resonated with my entire feeling of uh, how we underestimate what we have. I keep telling that to everybody, including to filmmakers. I say, well, you, have, you sit on such a number of incredibly breathtakingly interesting stories and you're looking elsewhere. Just discover Ukraine, discover your language, discover your culture, dis discover your stories, your experience, everything. You, you have nothing else. Uh, you don't have to look e uh, elsewhere. And in that sense, I think Ukrainians are slowly realizing this realization that they have to discover their own culture and their own uh, wealth uh, is, uh, is increasingly present in among uh, representatives of younger generation of Ukrainians. Uh, and I will tell you that, for instance, if you talk about the language, there are all kinds of grassroots initiatives to come up with uh, with solutions to onslaught of English loans in uh, information technology. Like people on web uh, on on the web would announce a competition for the best indigenously Ukrainian and transparent and immediately understandable equivalent of. Uh, 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 of English like to put a like under under post or a post I'd say a post so so a dobrik for the biker and and some of them are really very very interesting and very creative. The problem is that Ukrainian uh, oligarch uh, dominated mass media that should do the rest of it like lift these wonderful inventions and kind of spread them. Uh, on uh, on television, in the press, and everything, they don't do that because uh, they are indifferent to that kind of thing. So there's there's this very interesting situation where all all kinds of creativity at the grassroots level is there, but then very few people get the chance to a kind of uh, make it a fact of their own consciousness, uh, uh, and, and so sometimes it erupts through. Uh, the creativity of works of popular Ukrainian writers, uh, it does, uh, and most of the time it doesn't, but it happens. And I'm optimistic about that the tendency is in favor. Uh, now there's a growing appreciation of, uh, of the uh, uh, importance of language, uh, because when I started talking about uh, Russification in Ukraine and, and uh, uh, Ukrainian language disintegrating and falling apart and everything, uh, I was basically rejected and uh, called an extremist that, you know, I'm, I'm uh, putting too much emphasis on this. Now, a lot of people uh, say the same thing that I said 10 years ago in my uh, right, like, you know, uh, uh, publications in press and, and public lectures or the, on television or radio or uh, elsewhere. Uh, I don't know if I'm uh, answering no, no. Your, your question, but this dictionary also, uh, in my, in, uh, I hope, by describing Ukrainian through English, also uh, kind of uh, saps or kind of uh, rides on the prestige of the English language among Ukrainians. And pairing Ukrainian, which is very often still not as prestigious as Russian among, among the young, with a highly prestigious English language, without any intermediary, is already a, a very a, a revolutionary thing to do. Mind you that most English borrowings into Ukrainian are still done via Russian, with Russian corruptions, with Russian kind of, for instance, the Ukrainian word uh, gender. Why is it gender? It's not from English. It, it would have been gender, right? 
but because Russians first wrote it as gender, gender needs to be, gender needs to be, and so it's gender. And, and I, you give me a borrowing. First, it was borrowed to Russian uh, with all kinds of uh, special things because you, un well, uh, I can talk about it for a long time. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, are there any questions here and also online to our guests? Yes, please here and then, yes. Uh, yes, um, so as a Polish speaker and also just in general a Slavic language enthusiast, um, one thing I've noticed about Ukrainian is the um, is the number of Polish words that are I can also find or just in general similarities in Ukrainian. So I was wondering um, in your work, how did you go about that? I know that you were talking about trying to use, uh, I guess, pure Ukrainian words. Did you try to, uh, did you use Polish, similar Polish Ukrainian words, or did you try to find different uh, words to use instead? Well, uh, uh, thank you for your question. What's your name? Gabriela. 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 Uh, uh, well, I, I, I should, uh, I should plead guilty to being a, a bit of a Polonophile. I, uh, yeah. I uh, you know, Polish influences made me more of a Ukrainian. Uh, I was very much influenced uh, in young age by Polish culture, the language, and everything. But what particularly fascinated me was the wealth of Polish slang. I had close friends. Uh, among Polish students in Kiev, and I was absolutely blown away by the by by the creativity, by by the wonderful freshness and uh, and humor of Polish uh, student slang and everything else. And I was so envious that we didn't have that. I knew why why Ukrainians uh, did not have then and still don't have uh, slang, a rich slang as the Poles do or the English or Russians do. Uh, so. Uh, Answering to your questions directly, there was not much of a problem uh, kind of uh, identifying Ukrainian indigenous Ukrainian word, whether or not it is cognate with any particular Polish word. Of course, there are, uh, we share many words in common. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are uh, Polish words primarily uh, borrowed by Ukrainian. Polish vesele is, by the way, Ukrainian borrowing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not, not Polish word, mm -hmm. uh, one of the more rare uh, things. But uh, Ukrainian lexicographical tradition has been crystallized and presents, and, and so standard Ukrainian has been registered in so many dictionaries, number one. Number two, uh, you develop a, a sense as a kind of se a sixth or seventh or eighth sense for a Russian influence. And when you see, when you suspect a word to be a Russian imposition, you look it up in the dictionary and then you see who uses it in the illustrations. If it's used by Ukrainian, recognized Ukrainian classic writers or not, then it tells you something. If it's used, then it's bona fide, then it's the real McCoy. If it's not used, if it's used by Lenin in translation into Ukrainian, or the program of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union translated into Ukrainian, that's a sure signal that that, that word is imposed on Ukrainians and it should not be used any longer. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, yes, in the partially answered uh, my, my question uh, just now. But uh, first of all, I wanted to say, I've looked at the dictionary a little bit. It's a tremendous achievement. And uh, Thank you. it's going to be very valuable for anybody studying the language or improving the knowledge of the language. It's, it's really impressive. But uh, my question was, was this, uh, your descriptive and prescriptive will very often be in conflict. Uh, I mean, we know that the way people, the, 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 the language is used by common people, by ordinary people, uh, in ways that are not uh, grammatically correct or, or formulated in dictionaries. Uh, and it's important to have sort of a prescriptive uh, element to that. You know, this is the best uses, correct uses. But what are the criteria? What, uh, uh, what guides? The uh, the selection, uh, the the criteria that that, 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 that you use. Well, I once listened to Shulyov give a talk uh, on this topic, and he said there are three. 
uh, the usage by the best Ukrainian writers, so going into the past, the way you describe looking at how, how long it's been in the language, where it's coming from, what the best writers have used it for. Uh, the other one is uh, most common usage in the population because the population is a democratic process, right? The population decides it likes this word, it likes this use of this phrase, and it sticks, you know? There's sometimes a conflict. And then there's a third one, and that's the norms of the language, the evol natural evolution of the language. And you seem to be most influenced by that. You have a sort of a sense, as you said, an intuition, that this is what is the spirit of the language, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have to negotiate between these. How do you, uh, you know, how do you select the, the correct criteria? Well, there is, a, a, I am blessed by the fact, or that, that dilemma is not as acute to me, for my purposes, as it would be acute for somebody who writes a translation or, uh, a dictionary, just monolingual dictionary, that should include most of things. Because I have to select a relatively small uh, number of entries, with 9,000, 9, 10,000, all right? And so <clears throat> if we have to, and I write it at length, maybe not at length, in the introduction preface to the dictionary, that I favor shamelessly uh, out of two close synonyms, I, I would favor the one that uh, has no cognate in Russian, but uh, for instance, Chepate Izdate, I would, I would favor Chepate. Izdate would be used in, in, in illustrative quotations, but I would describe Chepate fully, and, and uh, Izdate would have the same colloquiality as Chepate, so there's no, there's no harm in overlooking uh, it. So that dilemma is not as acute uh, to me. Number two, uh, I, real, I appreciate the fact that uh, uh, ultimately people uh, give language its vitality by the, the mere fact of speaking it. And uh, the way they speak it, it should be also important. But so many times I have seen lately how people that we, many of us have decided to kind of uh, give up on and say they, they are the, the source of the worst in usage, the, in politics, in voting behavior, you name it, they, they vote for clowns and whatnot, suddenly show this amazing uh, sense of taste and uh, good usage. For instance, uh, let, uh, see how all of a sudden people started using Litovishta instead of a report. Just in my lifetime, the word that nobody used in Ukraine uh, for life, uh, for the life of me, I don't remember anybody saying, uh, say, Litovich 15 years ago. I myself uh, thought it was this hell, uh, strange, funny uh, diasporism or something. Now it's, it's a fashionable word. Novinar, other things, other, other such uh, new uh, kind of coinages. So, uh, there should be a balance, there should be a balance, but the main thing to me is there should be an incessant and increasing national conversation about the language, to discuss language, to keep language in focus and always, always, because to me, uh, the de decolonization uh, is uh, contingent on decolonizing the way you speak, the way you speak, inventing a new language. Uh, freeing the language from the, you know, influence, heavy influence of the, of the imperial culture. And increasingly, uh, I remember a very influential uh, historian from Lviv, he's not here, I will not name him by, by name because he can't respond to me, famously said, uh, why, have we already uh, done away with corruption that all that's left for us to, is to speak about language? And to me, it was this uh, manifestation of this very tragic lack of understanding that lang without the language, we are not moving anywhere if we don't restore our language to, to the language of, of a free society uh, and, and so on. So in that sense, I think that uh, the dilemma 
little as it exists for my particular type of dictionary, it does exist hugely for uh, in, in a larger uh, you know, scheme of things. And, uh, uh, and increasingly, we talk about language as something that defines us in the best sense of the way, not in this like, you know, all oh, these are nationalists talking about language, nothing but language and everything else. No, democracy without the language of easily understanding each other, the language of solidarity, you can't be, you can't feel solidarity outside the language. You, you can see it every step of the way when you jump on somebody who speaks your own language in some third country. That doesn't happen to Ukrainians because you, you, a Ukrainian will jump on Ukra a Russian speaking Ukrainian in Cuba because there's no solidarity. It doesn't work that way. And however, we, we, we deny it, it still works that way. I saw it in my own experience all the time. So uh, uh, again, I don't know if I answered your question. No, I understand. Uh, you want a conversation about the an awareness mm -hmm. about the importance of language and, and of and the, the and, and, and kind of deciding together what what which one of these three criteria i i'm also addressing this issue in the preface uh and and enumerate when i go by descriptive criteria and when i go by uh prescriptive criteria for instance descriptive criterion is uh, is the uh, inclusion of vulgar uh, words in my dictionary because they exist whether you like it or not they are there that's descriptive approach so it it kind of varies depending on the part on the phenomena uh, on the lexicographical phenomena that i'm dealing at in each particular instance are there any other questions uh yes please so um uh... I guess on a more technical level of selection, you know, Ukrainian is obviously a large language, and I'm sure you were working with a lot of sources and pulling and distilling this dictionary. Uh, you know, what was the method of selection that you used to like, you know, because you obviously had to make choices in the end, mm -hmm. including this and not this. And you know, what was what was your guiding uh, this? Uh, thank you for what's your name? Uh, Alex. You are a student here. Uh, yes. Great. Thank you for a wonderful question. By the way, that that is uh, perhaps the most uh, question number one every time I I talk about this dictionary, and it's very important. I didn't have the benefit being uh, normally dictionaries are written by groups of lexicographers, not by one crazy lexicographer who, if somebody told me what it meant ten years ago. I would say thank you, but thank you. I would not touch it with a nine <laughs> feet pole because I did not realize even a twentieth of what it means uh, uh, and what it entails. I was one. I didn't have the benefit of all the frequency statistical data, the frequency lists, uh, and even if I did, then there are there are there's one list, another list. So you have to compare them. You have to do these things and time flies and I was single minded about starting and finishing it before I died. So what I what I used shamelessly and without apologies was my own experience teaching Ukrainian starting with 1990. I took uh, the biggest, the most kind of the, the least defective uh, Ukrainian English dictionary, which was Ukrainian English dictionary of uh, the, the great Ukrainian or the comprehensive <coughs> Ukrainian English dictionary, I have it someplace, uh, not under position, and went through it with this, uh, with, a, with a highlighter and made my own executive decision. This word stays, this word goes, this word stays, this word goes. And as I worked on the dictionary already describing entries, working on them there were times when i threw out an entry and there were times when i said how can i have overlooked this you can't you can't do much without using this word so i self-corrected my, myself i also uh, i also solicited feedback from people who who uh, uh, did uh, editing and proofreading of the dictionary 
I'm now working on the second edition of the dictionary and I'm and I'm changing things yet again. I'm adding things. I'm, for instance, uh, I said, why on earth did, did I use the word ingredient in the dictionary when there is a perfectly nice Ukrainian wet club name? And I'm going, the second edition of the dictionary will not have ingredient, it's a borrowing. It, it, it has absolutely nothing to add to what already is meant by Skladnik. And, and so, so you understand the, the logic of it. I know it's not, uh, it's not uh, statistically uh, kind of substantiated. Uh, it opens the dictionary to all kinds of, of accusations in it being compiled completely subjectively. But I, I don't see how in my specific situation I could have done otherwise in 10 years compiling the dictionary that, that is that big. Uh, I skipped over that, but it, it, it's here. Uh, come on, me. Uh, no, the, the sources that I used in the dictionary. Here. Uh, ju just a couple of them, but also I used, for instance, for new words, I, o I always had, for instance, uh, I hear words that are used uh, often, uh, like mema, right? Even though mem, they say mem, not mema. Uh, I used uh, the internet. The internet was a wonderful thing. Without the internet, I wouldn't be able to do the dictionary in 30 years. Because everything is there, you can check things. Academic dictionary is there. Uh, all kinds of dictionaries are there. You can you can check things on it, and uh, you see, for instance, you can even compare the usage of the frequency of usage of a particular synonym when you want to decide which one of them to use. You Google them, and in that sense, if, if uh, how many results there are, I, do, I know it's imperfect. Uh, but but still, there is some information uh, uh, there. I also verified the uh, Ukrainian doesn't have such wonderful resources as Ngram, Google Ngram. Everybody is familiar with Google Ngram. It's a resource when you when you want to see which word is is more free or which uh, three member combination word combination is is uh, most frequently used in English and American literature, starting with the early 19th century up until today. You write them into, into a window, a search window through a comma, and they give you a graph. And it's a fantastic uh, resource to, uh, you know, to use when you're hesitant, should I use this or should I use this as a, as a translation? So uh, I went through all that too, uh, <laughs> so there. Did I answer it or not? Okay. We have a question here. Uh -huh. uh, would you take into regional considerations as you were writing it? I mean, some words are more used than certain regions of Ukraine, and some words aren't. Mm -hmm. um, but, and also, sort of, I don't know, it's getting complicated to talk to Ukraine right now about Western Ukrainian being the proper Ukrainian and the certain divides in the society that are causes, mm -hmm. as well as rural Ukrainian and like literature, more urban Ukrainian, mm -hmm. you know, and that also becomes almost like a social divide between people. Mm -hmm. um, so have you thought about that? Absolutely. What's your name? Yulia. Yulia. You're from Ukraine. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, yes. But then again, this, this issue is very complicated. Because if you ask a, a person in the street uh, what he or she thinks about Filizanka, they will tell you, oh, it's a halitism. And it is not, because Filizanka is used by, uh, uh, by, by people from central Ukraine in, in, in their, in their uh, writings. Putlerevsky there. For instance, I was reading Valerian Pismohelny this summer and jumped out of my bed. I was in Ukraine because he used the word rechenets. In the 30s, Rechenets is a deadline. Everybody in Ukraine used deadline. Nobody knows what Rechenets is. The worst case scenario, people will say term, termin. termin diploma? When is the deadline for submission of your diploma submission? Meanwhile, the word Rechenets has been assigned to diaspora. So you see, this is very subjective, what people think and what really is. So I, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, pay much attention to what people think, because people, uh, particularly in things uh, language related, 
have been so deeply brainwashed that their judgment is more often wrong than correct. What, uh, what uh, kind of uh, preoccupied me, what, is, what was important to me, was how it really is. And uh, to the extent I could unearth it by using, for instance, this guy uh, is absolutely a must to know and to read. So Zeloslav Karavansky's Secrets of the Ukrainian Language. How many of you are familiar with that? Is, is, uh, it's absolutely a discovery of the history and of Ukrainian language, its usage, Russification, things that we have already accepted as ours, whereas they are in positions from, from Russian and stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant uh, kind of work. Last year, there was a round table at the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences de de dedicated to this guy. To uh, he, Unfortunately, he, he is already uh, dead, uh, but uh, his uh, contribution into Ukrainian culture is in the process of being discovered as I speak. And this book is really very readable. You, you, won't, you won't put it away. He describes words, but uh, he just sweeps you off your feet the way he does it and everything. Unfortunately, it's not been translated. And I don't think if it's possible to translate it because he passes out uh, Ukrainian words, like, you know, how many devils can sit on the needle point or something or tip of the needle and stuff so um i tried to use uh, being uh, acutely aware of the death of the deficit of colloquial ukrainian and slangy ukrainian i introduced some slangy words uh, not as entries because uh, if, if you uh, the word have to be uh, in the meaning to speak bark in the meaning to speak the collocability would be more or less uh, uh, similar. Uh, but in uh, illustrative quotations, I would use them. Uh, and in the preface to the dictionary, I mention uh, cases where when I try to kind of re-inject uh, words uh, that are colloquial, that are very juicy, very kind of uh, um, imaginative, uh, attractive and uh, rendering uh, the language by their presence, mere presence in a sentence, some new vitality. Okay, yes, another yeah, question here. A, a quick question about, is there, are, are there any plans to put this dictionary or any of the editions online to have a sort of website where this is accessible? It's bilingual, also would be English. Absolutely. This is question that that's the competition with his, with his question uh, as first uh, they ask uh, and, and that's absolutely legitimate. I myself, uh, I was almost uh, disappointed uh, because my my uh, I thought that I would have to uh, raise uh, a lot of money uh, to pay for that kind of thing. But my publisher told me that they're working on it. And so hopefully uh, they kind of uh, implied that this is not as forbiddingly uh, complicated as I was prepared, bracing myself for. Uh, and so I'll keep you posted. Uh, you'll be the first to know when, when it comes, because uh, it basically I was told that it depends on, uh, on a particular uh, software that you pour it into, and then the software figures out all kinds of things. Uh, uh, this, I mean, uh, I don't know if you realize the little thing like a uh, word stress is an impossibility technically. I, I wasn't able to come across a phonetic Ukrainian key layout, keyboard layout, that has a little function like putting the stress over a vowel. The only one I have is was uh, was uh, developed at Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. It's imperfect. Uh, it allows me. It limits severely the array, the array of fonts that I can use, because some fonts shift the stress three three letters down the road or two letters up the road. Oh my God! It's it's just it's just a nightmare. And so, uh, and then again, uh, when the <laughs> you got you got the, the the idea. Are there any other questions? 
Let me just check online to see. Yes, we have one question online. Ooh, from Jim. Uh, James Oglesby. Uh, Yuri, what are some of the diction or word choice trends or even pronunciations that concern you the most in contemporary Ukrainian language? Are they trends that are harmful to the preservation of parts of the Ukrainian as a language in a world of globalization and social media? Uh, excellent question. Uh, pronunciation pertains to the level of language that is uh, one of the most difficult to penetrate in the situation of assimilationist pressure from a different language. The first level of language that is easiest to penetrate is, of course, vocabulary, lexicon. Then uh, grammar pronunciation, when people start uh, screwing pronunciation and replacing one phoneme for another, the entire uh, sound system starts shaking and crumbling. And for instance, what now I see happen in Ukrainian language is, the, is exactly such a very, very disturbing tendency. When a lot of native speakers of Ukrainian replace Ukrainian E as Rubete by E. And these two phonemes are very clearly and should very clearly be opposed in the Ukrainian phonetic system because uh, uh, some linguists wrote that the fact that Russians forbade Ukrainians to use E at the, in the word initial position at the beginning of the word threatened uh, to shake the, the balance of the Ukrainian uh, uh, vocal system because every phoneme uh, normally needs to be used in initial, medial, and final position to, to kind of preserve this, this balance. Because in Russian, Russian E61 is never used at the beginning of the word. They said that Ukrainian E cannot be used. But, but Russian E and Ukrainian E are, are very different uh, phoneme. So, these, uh, I, I see this every day. I listen to Ukrainian uh, television or listen people speak, how they sometimes even write their, they can't, uh, write their own names, family names, in a correct way. Like there is a film director called Lavrinishin. Lavrin is a man. His wife is Lavrinicha, not, not Lavrinicha, Lavrinicha, the suffix is e. And then Lavrenishin, but he writes Lavrenishin. And there's nothing wrong to his Ukrainian ear about that. And it goes on forever. It, it, uh, this ear, the sound is really threatened by being, is being replaced by E in the speech practice of uh, thousands of Ukrainians. That's just one example uh, uh, I, I would give to Jim. Jim yeah. Thank you for this question, Jim. Well, we have five minutes uh, to go. Any more questions in 1219 or everywhere? Uh, thank you, James said. Uh, okay, well, Yuri, again, uh, I, first I'd like to thank all of you for coming. It was great again to see people here and to have a discussion. I look forward to seeing you uh, as the semester unfolds, uh, as we have more in, in person and also to our audience online thank you also for for tuning in and um let us oh next week please um come to the film discussion online for, uh, on september 29th and again let's thank yuri for all the work he did in putting out this important book thank you Yuri. thank you thank you for coming.